Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel. Welcome to creating a sensor network that connects to the cloud. And this is part three in the three part series. In parts one and two is all about getting the data, the sensor data to the cloud. Here we're gonna talk about getting the data off the cloud and displaying it on our PC or our Android mobile device. So let's get started. Here's an overview of the network architecture. I showed this in both parts one and two, so I'm not gonna to talk too much about it. I will mention that how great it is the open source community because you know to try to do something like this five or ten years ago would have took a lot of development effort but because of open source pieces like the NRF 24L01 library for Arduino of course the Arduino platform itself the font cloud from SparkFun which is open source and then another piece of the puzzle is going to be MIT's App Inventor tool for creating Android apps so all open source Great to allow us to build a project like this in a fairly short amount of time. Here's me just showing some of the hardware. I will note that these wireless flex nodes I developed in another one of my video series. So I once again encourage you to check that out. I do sell these at forstronics.com if you want to use these. You don't have to use these for this project, but you can. The Maker 1000s I also sell at forstronics.com. And then this board that the NRF 24L01 module transceiver module is mounted on I also sell at my website which is called the mini proto board okay what are we doing in part three well we're gonna look at how to grab the data from the cloud so we'll look at some simple examples using web browser using a web browser then we'll look at a custom Android app and I will mention the Android app is just meant to be an example it's not meant to be a finished polished app you know, just like a lot of the things in this project, it's more of a foundation or an example for you to build on and customize for your own, you know, purposes. Then I'm also going to mention a note on how to extend the range of the sensor network. Someone recently mentioned this to me, so we'll, we'll talk briefly about that as well. And then I just want to mention that the code, you know, the Arduino code, the code or the file for the Android app is going to be on this GitHub link. So you can check it out there. You can access all the stuff you need there. This is, of course, an open source project. Let's talk about easy ways to get the data that we put on the cloud off the cloud. And all this stuff I'm going to show here is, is information I got from the documentation on font. So I'm not going to go into a great detail on it, but you can get more details on it with the link below. So Font has a number of HTTP requests that allow you to get the data and filter the data. Here are some example file formats. I shouldn't say example. Here are the file formats you can get the data in. CSV, JSON, JSONP. You know, some of these other ones are more for if you're using Java and a web browser, to, it creates a format that's easy to leverage there. Here I have an example HTTP string on that you can use for accessing the data in a CSV file. Of course, you need to put your key in here, your public key in here in place of this word public key. And then you can also use different filter methods. So if you don't want to grab all the data you have on the cloud, because you can have a lot up there, I think they allow, what, 50 megs? So that's a lot of data to grab. If you just want to grab pieces of the data, they have a lot of filtering tools. Here's an example I'm going to show, and we're going to use in the app an equal then. So EQ stands for equal then. Then I specify the field, and my field is going to be node, and then one. So this you know, if you had your public key in here, this would grab all the sensor readings logged for node one and would not grab the other ones for node two, node three, or, or so on and so forth. So let's look at some of these examples real quick. Okay, here's an example CSV file that I grabbed and I opened in Excel. So you can see the different fields, the node, the temperature the timestamp, the battery state, and as well as the timestamp that font adds. And so once you have it in the CSV file format, of course, you can filter it, you can plot it, you know, whatever. Then here's the data inside a web browser that I grabbed using the equal then, equal then node one. So remember this format because we're actually going to use this for grabbing data for the app, the equal then. So it gives you the order of the different fields so node and I just grabbed it for node one so we're, we're expecting all this to be one uh, temperature data timestamp battery state notice that I have a zero for the battery state this is going to be used in the the example 
and then I have the timestamp from font. So those are some easy ways to grab the data and you know analyze it on your computer itself. Now here's what we're going to do next. So we're going to show in a, a video of the app in action as well as some of the network pieces in action. So we'll show that and then next I'm going to go to the MIT App Inventor tool to look at the app that we built, the example app we built for grabbing the data. Okay, so what you're looking at is my coordinator. So this is the MKR1000. Here's the mini proto board with the NRF24L01 mounted on it. Now, notice I'm not using the ones I was using in the past, the NRF24s with the PCB antenna. I'm actually using one that has an extra power amplifier to get increased power to get increased range and has an antenna mount on it. Now, I wanted to mention this as how to get better range. So you can use the PCB ones with the antenna on the PCB. They're fine. They get, they get decent range amounts and it depends on how you're using them and the moisture content in the air, where you're using them as, to determine the exact range you're going to get. But if you want to get long range, I would recommend these modules with the shield on them. There's a lot of different versions of these out here and a lot of the PA or power amplifier versions don't have a shield on it. And if you try to use them for receiving data, the high powered antenna actually blanks out, or I should say the high power transmits actually blanks out the receiver if you don't have this shield and then you can't get the acknowledge packets and then it looks like the transmissions failed. So this is a topic I maybe will do a video on in the future, but if you want longer range, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet, I would recommend these, these versions with the PA, but also with the shield on it. And so in this setup, my coordinator is going to have one of these on it. And my node two is going to have one on these, one of these on it. And I actually have node two outside my house, way in the back of my backyard, you know, hundreds of feet away through walls. And we're going to see the communication works fine. Now note, if you have sensor nodes close by, you can still use the, the smaller transceivers. So there is the coordinator. You can also see my phone there. I'm just going to show the serial monitor. I don't know how clear this is, but it's just showing that we're getting data from the nodes. Then I'm going to show node one. Okay, so we saw node one. I have it hooked up to this advanced power supply. And what I did was I'm simulating a low battery condition. So I set the voltage for just above 2.7. And this is going to trigger the low battery condition on the sensor node, uh, basically stating that, oh no, the battery's still good enough, but it's dying, so you need to change it soon. And if you're wondering where does that come in or, or where did we add that feature, that is in the wireless sensor node video series that I did. So in the code there, there's in my library, the um, I think it's called wsnode.h file. That's where you set the thresholds for a low battery. So in this example, I think I have it set for 2.75. You can also see just as a note that the sensor node is actually asleep right now. Look at the low current we're getting. So anyway, that's, that's the reason that I have it hooked up to this power supply. So I'm simulating a low battery condition without having the battery die. Okay. Then next I'm going to show the app and please excuse my Android phone. The, the screen cover is peeling off and I also have it cracked. Uh, so I'm not a very responsible phone owner. So I'm going to go to my apps. So there up in this corner, it's, it says, uh, you know, cloud network, and that's the app I'm, I'm about to select. And it just has the default uh, MIT app inventor, you know, thumbnail picture there. Here it is actually down here too. Okay. So I just pushed this button. So basically how I have this set up is I have three buttons, get data for node one, get data for node two and get data for node three. So I just pressed the three, there's the data. So it appears in this text box. I parse some of the data because notice all we're seeing is the node three comes in here. We don't see it here anymore. We see the temperature, 63.9 degrees Fahrenheit. We see the timestamp and that's all. We don't see the font timestamp. So I parsed that out. And we also don't see the node number because it's up here in the label. And we also don't see the battery state. I actually checked the battery state in the app program 
and we'll see an example of that and then but I don't display it here and I know this is not the ideal way to look at the data you know a graph would be better and there is ways to build a graph in MIT App Inventor I just didn't want to do it for this example it takes a lot of effort but here's a way to just quickly look at the data visually so you can scroll through it so I'm showing that so that's node data 3 now I want to get it from 1 so I pressed the get node data from one and notice here I have the low battery warning. So remember on the power supply, I was simulating a lower battery condition. So I set up the app to detect that. And when it detects it, it shows an image of a low battery and in this label it just says low battery warning, but it's still running. So I can still get the data. So you can see me scroll down and, and look at the data. And then of course, if I want to get node two data, I just press node two and there's the data for node two. Okay, so that's the app, the example app in brief, just in action. Now let's look at the actual tool we use to build the app, the MIT App Inventor. Okay, you're looking at the MIT App Inventor two user interface. So I don't have time to go through how to use everything in the App Inventor two. There's, they have a lot of great tutorials. Just go to Google, search MIT App Inventor 2. It'll come up. You have to log in, you create an account, and then you can use it. It's real easy to use. You know, check out the tutorials. Here you're build, here's where you build the user interface of the app. And so you have things like buttons you can add, and I already have three buttons up here, but that's how I would add them. I have a text box. That's where you're seeing the data get displayed. And then you can change the various setting on these. So these are these are my objects that are going to be in the user interface of my app i also added a non-visual object a web one which is going to handle the the http communication between the app and the cloud okay let's look at the programming blocks for controlling the app so mit app inventor uses visual programming blocks instead of just textual to try and make it a little easier but what you're looking at here is this is essentially a function and it's a function that's called when button one is clicked. So when button one is clicked, I call this, uh, I'm using my web objects, I should say that web one. And here is that equal to node one function that I showed earlier. So that's all I'm using here. I make the call when I clicked button one and button one is get node one data. It then grabs it then makes the call to the cloud using this and then gets the data. And I'll show you where it handles the data later. Then these, these global variables, which I set here, are used to basically display the label of what node we're getting the information from. But notice we do the same thing for button two, which is node two, and then the same thing for button three. And then all I do for the, for the HTTP calls is I change the node number to two and then three. Then, Here's another web one object. And so this is, think of this as a function. And here, this response content is where I get the response from the cloud that we made the call for. And so it's gonna return that long string that we saw in the web browser earlier. Now this function, which is over here, is gonna parse through that string. And I'll mention that in a second. Now, I should mention on these blocks, when you when you download this this file these question mark box actually have comments in it so it helps you understand what's going on and you know while while i'm showing that i will mention when you download this from github you're going to get it in a aia file the aia file is not an app it's the file that you load into mit app inventor to get this design or project from this you can generate your app so that's what you need to do. So please make sure you understand how MIT App Inventor 2 works before you sort of dig into this. Okay, after I parse through the string of all the data, here's where I set text box one. So if you remember the text box where you see the data, that's where we're getting it. We're getting it from this global, global string that comes from this function that parses through the data. Then these if statements basically set the label to node one data or node two data. And it also checks to see if we need to, to indicate a low battery warning. And then this function, which is probably the, the most confusing part, and once again, I do have comments here, 
this is going to parse through all the data and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but basically what happens is we create an empty string. Uh, we basically feed in the string that the cloud returned. We break it into array lines and we separate these array objects by Z because if you looked at the data in the web browser, there's a Z at the end of the font timestamp. So I break up all the lines into array items and then I use this loop to go through the array items and pull out the information we're interested in. So what is the information we're interested in? Well, we're interested in the temperature. So here's where I get the temperature. I then also divide it by 10 because remember it's, it's, it's in a integer form because the cloud doesn't handle floats well. So I multiply it by 10 before I send it to the cloud. Here I'm dividing it by 10. And then here's where I get the timestamp. And then here is actually where I check the battery state. So I check the battery state. I set a global variable to check if the battery is good or bad. And then, um, yeah, anyway, here's where I parse the string. And, and I have comments here if you want to look through that. Okay, that's it for part three and for this project. So I really enjoyed this project. There was three parts, but it also leveraged parts from other series. So I think we covered a lot here. Once again, I'll mention this is this is meant to be more of a foundation or example for you to build on. It's not meant to be sort of a finished, polished product. And as I mentioned before, you know, I have to plug my website, forcetronics.com. A lot of the parts that I use in this project, you can get from forcetronics.com. If you have any comments or questions from this project, please use the comment section on YouTube. And thank you for watching.